All right, guys, welcome back to part two. I've identified the culprit. It's the mouse pad. Let me just note that this is part two of Day Night Daily number 655, where we're learning why Scarlet is the bomb. But there's a problem. There's two cats in the house. The cats like to rub their face on a variety of surfaces. And one of their absolute favorite surfaces to both dig their little claws into and rub their adorable faces against is my mouse pad. And it's gotten to the point where I can't click on anything. So listen, I'm using no mouse pad. Hope that's not too annoying. <laughs> All right. So we just talking about convergence. It's this idea of however you open, even if you do something crazy like, you know, two barracks and then have to pull back with the command center and all that jazz. Even with that, how do you expect to get back to the mid game? Even when you're having to do things like, oh, bunker up for defense. Well, the whole notion is you just think about what would you want around the 12 minute mark and you just begin plotting your way towards that. So it's not these little nuanced decisions like, okay, now we're going to get, uh, you know, a, a reactor up so we can hold off these kinds of attacks and we're going to then get a factory for the Hellions and then we got to make sure that we get the, you know, medevac up to be able to do the drops because he's vulnerable in this way. This is where I feel most people tend to get overwhelmed in StarCraft strategy when it feels like there's so many possibilities of stuff to do that when it's in an unfamiliar circumstance, how do you have any guide? This is what the mid-game convergence is. It's, it's pretty hard to go wrong if you just sort of think about where you're trying to get to and do any ordering at all. The correct ordering will be whatever lets you stay alive, but I mean, Bomber looks like he's doing some pretty sophisticated junk, you know, like going for reactor double barracks with double add-on. But, I mean, if you look at it more simply, he's getting some Hellions up. He's getting Stim. He's going to be getting some double engineering bay upgrades in just a bit. Yeah, there's one. He's going to need a starport for some medevacs. And I'm just going to continue to speed things up. The double check test to make sure that you are converging to your mid game properly. Oh, look, what do you know? There's another engineering bay. The test is always to just pause at around 11, 12 minutes. I mean, in the midst of all sorts of crazy aggression and obnoxious harassment and antics and all that, right around 12 minutes, what do we have? 1 1's done. 2 2's getting started. We have a bunch of barracks, soon to have tons of add ons. We're going to be able to build mines. We even have two out. And we're getting the rest of our upgrades. Ta-da! Mid-game convergence. In every matchup, you can just have a mid-game. You can do different openings. You can have different attacks. You can take damage. You can deal damage. But if you know what your mid-game convergence point is, you can sort of like, no matter where you are. So good. So, we used Bomber as an example, but I want to come back to our dear lady Scarlet at this uh, juncture in the game. Just getting mutilisks. Why? Because that is a low larva answer, as we talked about in part one, to be able to deal damage, to be able to stay alive, etc, 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 etc. And as they pop up... Dealing, all, dealing some nice damage seems good but I want you to look at this and say this is a defensive play ah it's a defensive play how would a zerg normally deal with this army barreling down the front over here well normally the way a zerg would deal with it is by having a lot of lings and banelings to overrun it and kill it here these mutilists are doing defensive maneuvers attacking key add-ons like the reactors trying to pick off key units trying to attack marines, and this is just defending, keeping the mutilisks at bay. In the meantime, Scarlet, she's getting her double evo, her macro hatch, her gold is up, and that's going to soon be a huge influx of demonies. There's even cute little tactics that are going on with zerglings and mutilisks. 
Not that concerned about that because every good player should know exactly to what he or she is converging. Now, there's uh, one in this gas geyser, and that kind of stinks because I think that Scarlet probably could have stepped into a little bit of a lead in this position. She's just playing brilliantly, uh, tactically, but, uh, you know, there's even another drone missing here. Even immortals like Scarlet make errors. I love this game. This game was so real. It was so hype. Alright, great. So how is Scarlet to spend her gas? Well, what's great is that with this huge influx of minerals, can easily, easily have plenty of money for tons of zerglings. Gonna be going for the, the, what's it called? What are these? Centrifugal hooks. I wanted to call them cardinal hooks, but there is no bird that lets you roll faster. So this hatch, this fourth, is coming down very early, given what happened in the game beforehand. And this is just due to the gold expansion, which everyone always just has no idea how to deal with this gigantic influx of money. I mean, look at Bomber, even with his, like, five mules down, only <laughs> a little bit ahead of Scarlet. <laughs> awesome. Alright, cool. Now, I think Bomber's doing some very intelligent maneuvers. Scarlet, god, her, her creep spread is so good. So good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, I want to ask you a question. How does this gold base change the Terran stratagems? Should Terran be going here first, or should Terran be doing this here base first? I'm not sure. I'm genuinely not so sure. What's the issue of taking this expansion from a Terran perspective? Well, for one, the Mutalisks right here can attack this and then immediately pull back here and defend this. So freaking easily. And even if the Marines pull all the way up, it's equally easy for the Lings and Banelings to just go and blast right in. This seems like a fragile expansion for Terran until Terran has some serious momentum. I think. It, I mean, it definitely is fragile. It might be overridden by how ridiculously much money you get, but what's really sweet that we're going to see Bomber do is that Bomber will be mining this as a third, because, you know, it's just the same thing as every other map. But when all three bases are mined out, he just lands here, and one gold being mined with all those excess workers collect about as much as the three bases. And when I say about as much, that's very hand wavy because I'm... The way I should say it is that it takes three bases to build up the infrastructure to do bio mine, including supply depots and structures. And once that infrastructure is built, then you can land it a gold and support that infrastructure. You don't quite have enough money to take the gold, rebuild the whole infrastructure, and then support it, but you can support if it's already up. Alright, so here comes a, a, a game normal. So here's one of the tenser spots of the game. And I have a lot of respect for Bomber for these like really slick little moves he's pulling. He has a very clear focused attack path. Just dropping right up here. This is just a great angle to exploit. I mean, Lings and Banelings are obviously going to have a hard time. And this is why Scarlet, I think, is appropriately building a few more mutalisks with her gas as opposed to uh, getting the usual flood obanelings um, and thus begins a game of tactical cat and mouse this is just really really tough control I'm kind of thinking that with the gold expansion, it might be appropriate to just do something like go spine, spine, spine. Not building anything here because Terran just walks up and kills it, but just backing it up a little bit to shut that down because, believe it or not, you have the money. I'm not sure whether it's better to do that or whether it's better to get a fifth macro hatch. Scarlet does have the funds to do it, but I think is just not used to having this much money in this position. I think Scarlet eventually gets the extra guys up in the gas. Nope, never does. Okay, cool. 
So in Scarlet's shoes, Scarlet's just trying to keep this base alive as long as possible because gold mines so quickly. Very often in these very aggressive games, just kind of going functionally, um, like rush to mine this out because you'll assume it gets killed is like a really good strategy. I think that Scarlet is doing another appropriate recognition, which is that there's not as many mines here as before. Previously in the matchup, it used to be almost exclusively maximum mine production, but Bomber has been building l mostly bio and fewer mines. Mines are a little bit of a support unit instead of a core unit, and that's because the splash damage has been reduced. So Scarlet, who is traditionally rushing up to like 20 or so mutas, now has a sort of excess in Banelings. And Banelings work best in medium-ish numbers. Medium because there's enough units that they can get the splash, but not so many units that they wind up going busto um, before they can uh, connect. So I like this choice for Scarlet to be focusing more on upgrades and banelings in this position. Mutilus in large numbers are generally good against uh, picking off mines, cleaning up medevacs, dealing those extra little tidbits of damage. And I think Scarlet does just such great moves here. Um, wow, I totally planned to talk about the great move after it happened. Well, that's not good. So for this drop to be effective for Bomber, he has to jam most of his units up against the wall. So, um, Scarlet appropriately sort of just surrounds and prevents all the Terran units from running away. Nice. Does end up in these sorts of awkwardities, but um, this is kind of easier to kill a whole army and then to send the Zerglings back and then clean it up. So I just thought this was continued great tactical uh, maneuvering by, by Lady Scarlet. So here's where I start to get torn. We've talked about tactics, and I remember watching this game, and I was like, all right, cool. I mean, Scarlet's starting to hold this off, but there's almost this timer. Once Terran gets this gold base up, everything is a crisis. <laughs> So, I mean, Scarlet has this luxury of being able to expand away and away from the Terran farther and farther and farther and farther, but, I mean, once Terran gets that gold up, Scarlet really has to have some sort of next step planned. So that can be, I'm going to hold this off so well that by the time I get Hive up um, and you take your gold, I'll have like 12 geysers and I can just ultra infester you to death. But the problem is that with the fact that Bomber is building so many Marines, I mean, I don't even think Bomber's at full production capacity at this point. Okay, so he, he is. But I mean, this one doesn't have a reactor. He's building 13 Marines at once. This is a lot more than most Terrans in this position. <laughs> so, Scarlet's kind of struggling to actually get enough gas to go Hive or to transition to Infestors. And I think that, like, it would have been an almost guaranteed loss for Scarlet if she tech really qu uh, quickly. I feel like the more aggression and the more heat you're feeling, the harder of a decision it is to go for the Infestation Pit. And I'm not saying you should delay it, I just think it mentally feels a lot harder. The general cue in my eyes is if the Mutalist count hits 20. And there's not a good amount of aggression. Because you have most of the gas that you really want on the field already in the form of units. Um, but yeah, so we talked a little bit about the tech transitioning. That Yeah, I feel like that if Scarlet gets up, like, you know, 20 or so Mutilus, she spent all the gas she needs to to defend drops, to, you know, be able to pick away at these attacks. And there needs to be a lull in damage. Well, okay. Well, since there's this lull in uh, attacking and damage going on, what's the best thing to do? I really like this move from Scarlet. To take some of these excess Banelings, maybe even take some excess Zerglings as well, and just do any sort of counter at the third. She doesn't need to know that it's there to know that this is a, a, a good play to make. And obviously, this is some of the most difficult control in the game. That's good. And this was like a huge turning point. 
like so huge. Oh my god. So Barma's continuing to drill the same point again and again and again. Scarlet's continuing to do this nice little maneuver where if Bomber gets a little bit too committed here to flood down here. And this was one of those like scary time moments where like Scarlet walked over so freaking many mines. And I want to contrast that engagement that we just saw with the engagement that we watched at, was it the 14 minute mark? Yeah. So in this engagement, this is at 14 minutes, Bomber had all of his units jammed against the top side of the wall. Uh, nope, it was another attack. Let me see if it comes up here. I can't remember when it was. Did it happen earlier than this? I think this is it, yeah. With everything jammed up against the top of the wall. I want you just to look at this shape. We have a full medevac here. And we see that like the, the center of the units is right on the wall. So this allows Scarlet to get a nice engagement because these are sort of pinned against the wall. Not just literally because of the Zerglings coming in, they're pinned because there's units on the high ground. So these sort of are working together. And then in this engagement, that's at the 1910, doo -doo -doo -doo. We see Bomber going for the same general concept, dropping up here to try to pick away at the uh, at the gold, pre-spreading, pre-splitting. Notice that there, there's no center that's on the wall. The center of Terran's army is actually quite far away from the wall. And without units having committed to this top side... Wait, did I zoom right past it? Damn it, I missed the battle! Uh, when did the battle happen? I was trying to zoom back to that, that flubbed battle. Yeah, here we go. Alright, phew! So there was the original engagement that we saw centered there, much earlier in the game. But now look at this engagement. The Terran is not actually crammed against this wall. And that's why this attack went a lot worse. Because you can see Bomber has the freedom to pull back. Imagine if, for instance, there were two or three medevacs here, and the rest of the Terran army was literally jammed right there. This would have been just a devastating attack. This could have been, like, a game right there with Scarlet winning. And it's those little tiny factors that can decide between a good engagement opportunity and a poor one. Also a little bit of an unusual one. Most people tend to like to upgrade to plus two um, attack and then just sort of chill on that. I think it's a very smart choice to do that in this spot. I like that a lot. So there's a couple of other things that Scarlet's obviously doing well. Spreading the creep, yada yada yada. Also getting pneumatized carapace. I would call that another one of those core mid-game pieces that's like just super important and good to have. So right around now, after this round of Banelings gets produced, and after this aggression tunes down, Right about now is when I would normally say, yeah, Infestation Pit is a really good choice. Really like that as a goal. Especially if these geysers can get going. Scarlet doesn't have a lot of um, drones, though. does have the goal for the maximum awesomeness into income. Um, it's continued tiny counterattacks, but this is what makes Bomber really good, is that these counterattacks can only ever do so much damage. And Jadong definitely likes to do these kinds of attacks. Jadong techs up to Hive very, very quickly. If not for anything, then for Adrenal Gland. Yeah. And that's why it is okay, I think, to have thrown down an Infestation Pit already, but... Obviously, the tenseness is going down. And here is where, in my eyes, is where some of the hardest decisions in the game happen. And I can't believe Scarlet made, like, so many impossible decisions in a row. Okay, here's the thing. A lot of times we, we, we say things are a risky play. And in reality, there's not, like, randomness in there. There's not, like, oh, yeah, Scarlet's going to go for an attack that has heavy RNG. Whoo! Heart of the Lings! You know, you can't... It's... 
StarCraft 2 is pretty deterministic in a lot of situations, what's actually going to happen once you've made the decision. But when we say risky, we mean a decision that is so hard to do properly, and if you do it improperly, the punishments are grave. This is like only throwing Hail Mary passes in football. Like, yeah, you might be able to score three touchdowns in a row to tie the series up, but it's really easy to get intercepted. Your quarterback is pretty vulnerable that whole time. Sports? No, nah, enough of sports. In this situation, Scarlet is getting blasted in the front at what many would call the key base, but here's the first one, in my eyes, is a really, really hard decision to make. By the way, yay for three links. Bombers splitting, bombers micro, bombers upgrades. Oh my god, so devastating. Scarlet just says, you know what? Abandon ship on this base. And that is the absolutely correct choice to do. Especially right now, once it's all gone. Most of the time here. So, this is where lesser zergs attack until all the mutalisks are dead. And then they say GG. That's what happens here. So Scarlet, I'm going to slow it down to normal, begins to engage here. And then responsibly pulls back and just lets the gold die. Just lets the gold die. Another really difficult situation. Building these six mutalists that we see up here. Very easy to go baneling crazy. But Scarlet's keeping that mute account high. Now why is that? In the low econ, late situations. Same general ideas that we talked about in the early game. Uh, but for slightly different reasons. We talked about the sort of resource-heavy larva light units versus the sort of en masse, big, juicy, swarmy units. So Zerglings and Banelings are big and swarmy and juicy. Mutalists are sort of like technical and stuff. The technical, the, the, the expensive on the larva units, tend to be the ones that you have the most ability to get value out of. So mutalists, you can harass here and harass there, pull back, engage in good, and if you're talented enough, you can skill your way into doing a lot of damage with uh, mutalists. Banelings don't actually give you an opportunity to skill your way up. Sure, there's a huge range in what's possible with banelings, but you'll, you'll, you'll never have that player who nails really good baneling shots by microing really well. If you do well once with a baneling, great. It's now dead. By definition, there's a cap on how good uh, that bane link can be. With the exception of Burrow, but uh, I'm ignoring that intentionally for now. But the Mutalist is a really smart thing to do in these low econ situations because there's not a lot of workers mining here, there's no gold. Scarlet scouted these positions. Although banelings are good against marines in direct engagements, Scarlet just begins to mass more Mutalisks to do things like this, to skill that way forward. And just lets this die. Very hard choice to make. Continues to pull around with many Omuta. Just look at all these like great movements there. By letting this expansion die, Scarlet was able to scoop all these extra units up and have these guys get pinned up at the top side. And this is just, I think, a, a very sexy engagement by both players. Look at, that, look at those extra mutas getting produced. This girl's trying to keep that muta count high. I know banelings are listed as the counter to mariners, but it's the mutas that you can get the most value out of in these kinds of positions. And continued linger counter-attacker. Now here's the sick part of this game. In this late situation, all Bomber does is build marines. That's it. He doesn't even really have any medevacs or any mines. It's like only marines. And you may have heard me say this earlier. Banelings are good in medium-ish numbers. That's where they shine. They're a little weaker and large, and they are actually pretty difficult to do properly in the small situation. Because if you're up against someone who can micro well, 
he just splits himself up. I'm not even saying he kills the Banelings. He just splits himself up so the Banelings are at most doing one or two Marines worth of damage. But this is so hard to do. These decisions are so difficult. But making the Mutilus here, I think, was the savior of Scarlet in this spot. So, we still have about, let's see, 15 minutes of this game. Is that right-ish? No, more like 14. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to see Scarlet go down to no mining bases for like 5 or 10 minutes. I just think that there's so many brilliant moves that Scarlet's making by being carefully repositioning... Obviously, Bomber's playing like a madman. He's playing he's playing like a mad bomber, actually. I don't know. Um, but I love these decisions by Scarlet to continue to focus on Mutalisks as it gets to a low econ situation. Uh, and even though there's no Hive, if the Infestation Pit were to have gone down and the Hive were to have come up, the only real upgrade you can afford to do in that position is the Adrenal Glands. Um, so when we come back, we'll see how the hell Scarlet pulls off this miracle. Woohoo!